Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my individual review of the Sirai Sniper 33mm f1.2. This is an autofocusing lens that is a part of a series of lenses that debuted with a 23mm, then this 33mm, and finally a 56mm f1.2. I have taken a look at the series as a whole if you want to check out the kind of overview and how they all work together. And I've also released previously the review of the 23mm with the 56mm review to follow. This lens and this series of lenses, they debut at a, a quality price under 350 US dollars and available for even less with some discounts. And you can also get them as a series in a case, um, all prepared to kind of coordinate together. They have identical builds. They're set up to where you can easily swap on a, a gimbal or something similar. And they have a similar color tone throughout and so that the footage or the photos are going to match nicely. So some nice thoughts when it comes to using them as a series. In a nutshell, this is a lens that is very nicely built. It uses premium materials. It has average autofocus for stills and below average autofocus for video. It has extremely nice bokeh and it does sharpen up when it's stopped down, but it also has a lot of chromatic aberrations and it has low contrast at large apertures. It's a modern lens when it comes to the build and the design, but the optics are kind of a retro aesthetic. And that is both good and bad, depending on what you're looking for in a lens. What we'll do in today's review is that I will go through and give you the broad strokes, and then those of you that want a deeper dive into the optical performance can look at that at the end of the review. And there, of course, is a shortcut to that in the timestamp below. First, however, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. And use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So 33 millimeters when applied to the various APS-C crop factors that it's applied for. There is, it's available in a Nikon Z mount, Sony E mount, and then also Fuji X mount, but it is only an APS-C lens. So in all of these cases, I've tested on Fuji here, when you apply that 1.5 times crop factor, you have essentially a 50 millimeter equivalent lens. Obviously a very, very popular focal length for a lot of reasons. Now with this series, they have three different very distinctive looks that you can opt from. There is the black that has carbon fiber, real carbon fiber accents here. There is the silver look that has aluminum alloy accents. And then there are is the white look that has a ceramic baked paint as a part of the design. The lens is 72 millimeters in diameter by 92 millimeters in length. That's 2.8 by 3.6 inches. And it weighs in at right under 400 grams or 14 ounces. I give really high marks to this series as a whole when it comes to the design, which is actually unique, which is rare in the market. There are so many lenses out there and a lot of them look you know, fairly similar, but that's not really true of this Sniper series. There is a distinct look to them, an aesthetic that is all series, and so I appreciate that. I appreciate the quality materials that are here. The focus ring is a little bit on the light side, but it works okay. Although I will note there's 360 degrees of intended rotation. On Fuji, if you try to get down to minimum focus, a lot of times it's additional rotations to get it all the way there. It's just kind of a Fuji quirk, which is probably not the case on other platforms. Very nice materials as noted, but outside of that, there's not really a lot of features. There's no AF MF switch. There's no aperture ring on Fuji that tends to be missed because some of the competitors will have it. It does have a USB-C port on the metal lens mount, and that is great because it allows you to do firmware updates and to make sure that the lens stays current. And also, you know, maybe we'll see an improvement to the autofocus performance via firmware in the future. It does come with this pedal shaped lens hood, which is made out of plastic. Nothing particularly special, though I do appreciate the fact that we have got a gripped surface that makes it easier to mount and unmount. 
Inside, there are 11 aperture blades, and I do appreciate that because it helps to maintain a nicely circular shape as you stop the lens down. A lens with a maximum aperture of f1.2 has a lot of potential for stopping down, so a high blade count is welcome in this, and a little bit more of a, a better touch that is included. Not so positive is the minimum focus distance. It is 40 centimeters, and as you can see, the resulting magnification is quite low, 0 0.10 times. You can still create a lot of background blur, but that has much more to do with the f1.2 aperture than what it does to the ability to focus close. You're not gonna mistake this for a macro lens in any way, shape, or form. So overall, it is a little bit on the larger and heavier side com compared to some competitors. However, it doesn't have a lot going on in terms of features other than a price, which is quite reasonable, particularly for an autofocusing f1.2 lens. Now on the note of autofocus, this has an STM or a stepping focus motor. You can see from the focus pull test that focus speed is not bad. I would say it's slightly below average, but of course average has improved over time and I'm used to really, really fast autofocus at this point. So slightly before average, but I think adequate in speed for a lot of different applications. Overall focus noise is fairly low. If you put your ear next to it or if you're filming, you can hear some light clicks and whirs. But what you will hear is if you're at a larger aperture in between um, holding down, you know, either depressing the shutter or half pr pressing it down, the aperture blades actually close down when not in use and they open up whenever you're actually focusing for the photo. And so as a byproduct, you will hear a little bit of clicking noise as those aperture blades close and open back up. And so that's actually the primary sound that you hear during focus. I actually found that the quality of focus is generally good. Now, as we're going to see, this lens is really low contrast wide open. As a byproduct, it can be a little bit hard to tell that images are well focused until you really look in at a pixel level and distinguish that even though something is not amazingly sharp, it is actually in focus. But as I did that, I realized that focus actually was actually quite good. You can see here that it's tracking the eye of my uh, dead-eyed model there quite well, no issues there. And as I move around, the box is staying locked in on the eye. So all of those are good results. And I would say that for stills, I have no complaints about autofocus. I was able to shoot everything that I wanted without any kind of issue. When it comes to the video AF side of things, this actually is the best of the series, but unfortunately that's not saying a lot because this is not a great series when it comes to video AF. As you can see from the focus pulls, the focus pulls are not fast and they're not always particularly confident. There is some settling issues, but you can see the positive is, is that it is a smooth transition without visible steps. We did see some visible stepping on the 23 millimeter and the 56 millimeter is a whole other uh, can of worms, which we'll get to later. But overall, it's not bad. Also, I found that when I did the hand test, it was the most reactive of the three lenses in that. But you do, do see that there is some hesitation before focus transitions are made. There's a little bit of lag there for actual focus shift begins to take place. On a positive note, focus breathing was quite low. And what I will say about the focus pulls is they're slow and they're deliberate, but they're smooth enough that combined with the low focus breathing, they have a slightly cinematic look to them, which is not bad. At the same time though, this is certainly not a top video choice and it, the focus is also not reactive enough. If you're wanting, if your goal is to capture fast action, you need to look elsewhere. So when it comes to the image quality, I'll give you a quick overview of performance. And then if you wanna hang around for the deep dive, you're welcome to do so. This lens has 12 elements in 11 groups, including one ED element, one HR element. This is a lens with what I would call an extreme dual personality. Wide open, it has very high chromatic aberrations. And so as a byproduct, it is quite dreamy, bloomy, wide open without a lot of, of contrast. And so sharpness at, at wide apertures is not great. Bokeh, on the other hand, is extremely nice much softer and creamier than what you're going to see from some competing lenses. And so very good in that regard. The lens will sharpen up when it is stopped down. And uh, starting at about F4 to F5.6, it gets sharp enough that uh, I would say that I was satisfied with the sharpness results. They're more typical and modern looking, whereas the lens has kind of a, a vintage look to it wide open. 
positive things for various aspects of that is that it does have low distortion, almost no distortion. It has fairly low vignette, no issue there. But uh, chromatic aberrations, particularly of the longitudinal type, are really, really obvious and persistent, probably even to F2 and a little bit beyond. And so they don't clear up particularly fast. And so that would be one of the negative issues there. The lens also does exhibit quite a lot of flare artifacts um, of a variety of things. Some of them can be artistic, and if you use them wisely, you might look them look like them, but very, very likely most people will be put off by them. And so in an overall conclusion, I would say that the 33 millimeter is maybe my least favorite of the series. There are too many aberrations. The contrast is just a little bit too low, and the autofocus is not amazingly sophisticated. I think it's good enough for photos, but and, and it's good enough for most people, but not a great option for video. The lens is competitively priced for an autofocusing f1.2 lens, and I would say that it fits best for those that really like more of a vintage kind of look. You like lower contrast, maybe find it flattering for portraits or for your general purpose shots, and you prefer kind of the look of images rather than pixel pe uh, peeping at a detail. And so if you like the ability to have different kinds of looks wide open and then a different look when stopped down, the lens might suit your purposes there. For me, I would say that on Fuji, the 33 millimeter F1.4 Fuji non lens is worth the extra money or as a compromise, the Viltrox Pro AF 27 millimeter F1.2 just does a lot of things really, really well and would probably be my top budget pick there. Now, if you want more information, you can either look at the description down below and catch my full text review or the image gallery there. There's buying links there. And if you want more information, stay tuned right after this and we'll do our deep dive into the optical performance of the lens. Our examination of the 33 millimeter starts with a definite win when it comes to vignette and distortion. You can see the distortion is pretty close to non-existent. Those lines are straight enough that they really need no actual correction and also vignette while present is really quite low for an f1.2 lens. Now there is actually a correction profile available in Lightroom already, which surprised me. But if we turn that off and just look at the manual correction, you can see I've dialed in a minus one to correct what little bit of pincushion distortion was there. And then vignette is about two stops, a plus 53, and then sliding the midpoint over. For an f1.2 lens, this is low vignette, and obviously that's a really desirable distortion level there. Now, unfortunately, our next test is much less rosy. You can see that there are very significant levels of longitudinal chromatic aberrations, so both fringing before and major fringing after the plane of focus. That is going to show up in real-world results. You can see here that contrast is definitely reduced due to fringing in various places, and then also in bokeh highlights, you're going to see that fringing. Uh, likewise, here you can see that as we transition away from the plane of focus. So before you've got some of the, you know, the magenta fringing is a little bit lighter, though it's obviously present. And then as you transition away, there's definitely a lot of that green blue fringing that is present. Now, lateral chromatic aberrations are essentially a non-issue. You can see that even with corrections turned off, we have very little in terms of any kind of fringing on either side of the black and white transitions there. So no problem there. Now, taking a look at our resolution and contrast, obviously this is a, a tremendous torture test for a lens like this in that 40 megapixels on APS-C is an extremely dense pixel resolution. And I examine these, when I do these reviews, I examine at 200% magnification. So any and all flaws will be on display. And there are definitely some flaws here. You can see that there is very low contrast and thus the inability to really sharply define the details here in the text, the various textures that are there. The mid frame also is continuing that trend. You can just see as we kind of pan down over these various bills, it's almost like a smear of Vaseline over it. Going into the corners, you can see that that low contrast is there, and then you can see the detail drops off even further towards the edge of the frame. That low contrast does affect real-world world images. Now, this is actually stopped down to F2 for depth of field, but you can see that while it is accurately focused on the first face here, 
overall contrast makes it seem like the image is not really fully in focus. Now, I will also note that some people prefer that lower contrast in that it just is a little more flattering to any kind of skin imperfections. We can see here from one of my test shots when I was doing the testing for autofocus that again, focus is accurate here, but you can also see that because of that lower contrast, it can be a little bit hard to tell. At the same time, also you can see looking ahead that the bokeh is really, really nice from the lens. Another shot here, we can see that it doesn't look like it's in focus. Now, if you go into a pixel level, you can see that it actually is accurately focused on the iris of Nala there. But because, you know, the it's both a shallow depth of field and then also contrast is low, it's hard to see without going into a pixel level if anything is actually in focus. Stopping down a little bit to f1.6 does slightly improve contrast, but you can see here we're actually focused on the far eye there. But you can see that in the textures of the fur around the eyes, there's just nothing that's really, really crisp that is there. Now, stopping down to f1.4 on the right, you can see that contrast does improve a little bit, but not enough to make kind of a massive difference when it comes to our textures. In the mid-frame, there's a little bit darker. You can see that, so that contrast has improved the, the shadows, but not necessarily enough to where the details are really visible and present. Likewise, down here into the corner, again, it's mostly that the dark areas have become a little bit darker, but not that the ability to resolve the fine details has improved yet. Now, price-wise, it may be a, an unfair comparison, but the lens that I have on hand, well, not on hand, but that I've tested at the same resolution level, that is exactly a 33mm lens, is Fuji's own XF 33mm f1.4. And so you can see that on that 40 megapixel sensor, it is a, it's a radical difference uh, in terms of the performance at f1.4. This is both lenses at f1.4 in the mid-frame and then down into the corner. And so the Siri lens is definitely at a disadvantage when it comes to the ability to have good resolution at a large aperture. Stopping down another stop to f2 there on the right. Again, it does give us a little bit of boost in contrast. You can see the text is starting to resolve a little bit better, but we're still a far cry off from where that Fuji lens was even at f1.4. Most of what we're seeing still is just a, a slight improvement of that contrast, but not enough to where it makes a radical difference yet. From f2 to f2.8 shows a similar level of improvement to where, again, it's starting to get better. This is getting to where it might be an acceptable wide open performance if you're you know, evaluating detail and contrast. Mid frame is starting to look fairly competent now. Corners are improving, but still not super sharp yet. Now by f4, the corners are starting to sharpen up and we're starting to look more like a modern lens in terms of the resolution and detail. By f5.6, we're now looking pretty competent there. Uh, resolution is looking nice and crisp. And so you definitely have very much a dual personality to this lens where it is softer and dreamy wide open and then sharpens down and improves contrast at smaller apertures. Now, in many ways, sharpness and contrast peaks at f8, and then after that, diffraction is going to start softening the image. However, because the lens is fairly soft to begin with, I find that diffraction uh, doesn't impact things quite as much as usual because the contrast is low at large apertures anyway. And so I would say that you could probably use this lens throughout the zoom range without taking, or shoot, throughout the aperture range without taking too big of a hit, as you can see here. I mean, it is reduced somewhat, but it's not terrible. It's still very usable and actually better than what we saw at large apertures. Now, despite, you know, the kind of dreamy look wide open, this image is actually currently my desktop background because I really liked it. And as you can see at a pixel level, it actually looks quite good all across the frame that there's good detail that is resolved there. It's an intriguing image to me. And so it shows again, that dual personality. Now, what's also interesting to me is that at smaller apertures, when I compared this lens with the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter f2.8, a lens that I actually think is, is really competent for a zoom lens on this high resolution sensor, I actually instinctively preferred the images off of the prime lens when it came to various details. They were just a little bit crisper. Um, you can see in this zone here, it's just a little bit better, a little bit better contrast. And also I found like the color rendition was just slightly better. 
here's another shot here. And if you actually pop in and look, now obviously this is not shot at the same focal length. Looking in this zone, however, you can see if you compare the two that the kind of micro contrast, you know, contrast in that general area is actually a little bit better. And thus the details are a little bit crisper looking at the 33 millimeter versus the zoom lens. Now, our up-close performance is, you know, at this is at f1.2, is just about what you would expect. It's really not that fantastic. It's, it kind of bears out. But the trade-off is, is that the lower contrast from this lens allows it to really have a very, very soft out-of-focus rendering. Sharper, higher contrast lenses, you know, which like the Sigma approach, a lot of times the bokeh to me is only okay from them because it does tend to have a little bit more outlining, a little too much contrast in those areas. Now, of course, the downside here is if you have bright specular highlights, it doesn't do so great in that. You can see just lots of fringing here and, of course, fringing in the specular highlights. The shape of them, geometry is not too bad. And so, and you can see looking into the bowcast circles, there's none of those concentric rings or any kind of busyness like that. But that fringing is going to be a factor. But if you look beyond that, the ability to just kind of blur out backgrounds is really quite nice. So the strength of this lens is going to be in those that really prefer the ability to really blur out backgrounds and to have a more pleasing bokeh than what a lot of the more modern, more corrected lenses can produce. Now flare resistance is also pretty vintage in its performance in that this lens will produce a lot of different flare artifacts. As you can see here, um, you can see there's, uh, you know, there's some blobs of color here, but if you shoot at larger apertures, you'll just get kind of flooded with, with light. And, uh, and also it will exhibit some flashing. And if we pan back and forth, you can see that there's just a wide variety of different uh, flare effects that are quite vintage in the performance there. Can be used to artistic effect if you're very careful or if you like that look but for some people that are just looking for the ability to shoot into bright lights without any kind of flare artifacts this is not going to be your lens those of you that have stuck to the end thanks for watching have a great day and let the light in